Um, our next presentation is by Martha Cagle with um, Unity of Greater New Orleans. And Martha will uh, trade places with you and bring you up here. Thanks very much. First, I'm going to introduce Martha, whose um, credentials for this are, are extraordinary. And Angela, help yourself to a seat here. I'm going to move you. away. Um, so Martha is a um, journalism graduate from Drake University, where she was in fact the outstanding journalism graduate and served as editor-in-chief of the um, campus's award-winning newspaper. Um, she um, left a brief um, experience in journalism to come be the ACLU director of Louisiana here in New Orleans and then um, migrated to the ACLU of Northern California where she was the assistant director. I think that's the ideal job. You're in fertile territory for civil liberties and you're not the director who has to take all the flack, but the assistant director. Um, and having done that for multiple years, she then went to law school at Stanford where she received um, recognition as the Stanford Public Interest Fellow. She was an editor of the Stanford Law Review. She received a legal research and writing prize and compiled a hell of a grade point average um, in completing her studies at Stanford. Um, she um, then went on to clerk for a judge on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal. She also served a two-year stint as a Skadden Fellow here in Louisiana. The um, Skadden Arp Law Firm um, awards 25 public interest fellowships each year and um, Martha was the recipient of one of those. She's um, been honored as Agenda for Children's Voice for Louisiana's Children Award and the LS, uh, Louisiana State Bar Association Career Public Interest Award. So her remarks today were responsive to the request that um, Jay Banks made for an introduction to the Constituent Services Network and in Martha's case it has to do with um, the homeless. Um, she's going to talk about unity and its collaborative agencies, um, how they've helped veterans and children are currently helping people with disabilities, um, an analysis of who the homeless are, where they sleep, um, the Orleans Jefferson breakdown, funding sources for homelessness in New Orleans, and um, housing and services including crisis, short term, and permanent. So I'm going to try to get this up. Martha, where you can use it and migrate from okay. section to section, distribute it. Well, anyway, thank you for that embarrassing introduction going back into my college days, which was very long ago. Thank um, you. But I'm very excited about the new council and uh, the incredible credentials that the new council is bringing uh, to the table and the commitment to the city, and I just feel very optimistic that we will really make a lot of progress together. So I just wanted to go over, tell you a little bit about Unity for those who might not know too much about it. Uh, a quick overview of homelessness, um, what funding is available to address homelessness in our city, which is still a very significant problem, what types of housing and services are available, and then how to access Unity's coordinated access system. Um, interestingly enough, this very topic is in flux because of the new HUD requirement um, that we change our system from the way it used to be where you would go to each different agency to apply for services. And now uh, HUD, which funds most of these services, is requiring that there be much more of a centralized system. And they are doing that because they want to make sure that the HUD resources that are supporting these things are being used most effectively for the people who need the resources the most. And so they want uh, uniform prioritization of the people who've been homeless the longest with the most severe disabilities. Because you see, there's just not enough resources for everyone. That's the problem. This is not like food stamps where there's an entitlement. There is some amount of homeless resources and far too many homeless people for all of those, for what resources are available. So they want the resources prioritized better they want um, the system to be fair so that uh, there is a uniform assessment done and uniform uh, procedures for uh, giving out these resources. And they want to make sure that it's accessible. And instead of having to go to 50 different agencies to apply, there's only one place you need to go. Um, so that's what it's about. So just in general, Unity has been around for 25 years. It was started in part by uh, the city of New Orleans and 
you know, a bunch of uh, the nonprofits all came together to create unity. And a lot of the, the reason for it was because there was a new HUD funding stream on homelessness and you could tap into it better with a coordinated effort. It was competitive. And HUD preferred, uh, at that time, communities that had a coordinated approach. Now they require it. And so you can't apply for these funds as a single governmental entity or as a single nonprofit agency. They can only be applied for by a coordinated, what we call a continuum of care. Um, and Unity is designated as the lead agency um, for New Orleans and for Jefferson Parish uh, for those funds that are competitive, very stiffly competitive nationally. Um, and so we write the application on behalf of the whole community. And then we, um, the, the application actually says who's going to receive the funds in terms of which agency. Um, and whether or not we get the funds, additional funds, is dependent in great part on whether we've reduced homelessness. So it's kind of the flip of a lot of funding. Instead of, hey, we have a lot of homeless people, give us funding. HUD is looking at how effective we've been at reducing homelessness. So um, how successful have we been in maintaining funding? Is it? We've been, been we've been very successful, although HUD has um, slashed in the past, they have uh, really grandfathered in and protected uh, old grants, and those were pretty much grandfathered in. In recent years, uh, just because there hasn't been enough new money allocated by Congress, they've gotten uh, much uh, more slashy about getting rid of some of the renewals um, that aren't their priority. So for example, transitional housing is no longer favored by HUD, and they have cut a lot of transitional housing. Um, but in general, compared to other communities, we've done much better than, than, than almost everyone. We, we have gotten a lot more um, new funding and have had less serious slashing, although it still felt really bad to us than other communities have had. So in terms of what we get, we get more than we need, we get all we need, we get 10% of what we need. Nobody gets well. all they need. I mean, there, like I said, there's there's uh, not enough resources for all the homeless people. Um, so if ideally, what 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 else would we need to do? How much more would you need to get what we need to be? Well, that's a good question. I wish I had a ready answer to it, and I should have a ready answer to it. Um, but uh, you know, we we need many millions of dollars more than what we get, and the problem is is that. It's never a one and done. Most of the people that we're serving are um, chronically homeless people with disabilities. And they are people who, you know, 30 years ago they would have been institutionalized for life, for people with schizophrenia and other serious mental illnesses. And now, because of Supreme Court decisions, that's not done anymore. Uh, and also because of just changes in the healthcare system. That's not done anymore, so they're just left to be homeless and then the resources we have have to house them and keep them housed. So once we house a homeless person, they're our client for life. So a lot of these resources are being used for people who were homeless years ago. That's the difficulty of it. It's not, it's not a simple process. Let me just um, give you an overview and then we can, um, you know, I'd love to have personal one-on-one -on -one conversations and answer all of your questions, but I know we don't have a whole lot of time just to go through it really quickly. Um, <clears throat> so, let me go to the 89% reduction in homelessness really quick. Um, since 2007, and this is measured by an annual count that we do in January of every year, a comprehensive effort to survey every homeless person uh, defined by HUD as homeless which is a pretty narrow definition. So we're only talking about, in these counts, people who are on the street, this is kind of far into the presentation, people who are on the street, people who are um, in abandoned buildings, people who are in emergency shelter designated for the homeless or transitional housing designated for the homeless. We're not counting, because HUD doesn't count, people who are living pillar to post, what we might call couch surfing. You know, they don't have their own place, so they're staying with a friend here one night and a cousin another night. Those people aren't even count, counted in these uh, statistics unless they're out 
out on the street or in a shelter on that particular night um, that of the count. It's one night count. So you can see that the high water mark for homelessness literally was uh, January 2007, 11,619, and it's down to 1,301, which is a 89% reduction. No other city in the United States has had a reduction that that dramatic. Of course, it's because things were so bad for us after Katrina, but it really has been a tremendous effort. And we've done it through providing permanent housing, mostly in the form of rent assistance with you know, mostly mom and pop landlords around the city. Um, and uh, with services where case managers actually come into the home. We do this either permanently for people with serious disabilities, or we do it on a short-term basis. If it's, for example, a family where the head of household doesn't have a serious disability or an individual um, where the head of household does not, doesn't have a serious disability. Um, we were the first city to achieve a functional zero in veteran homelessness, and we now have a system for the last three years where we've been permanently housing newly homeless veterans within an average of 30 days, um, which is, I think we're the only city to do that. We've achieved a similar um, feat in the realm of homeless families with children, where we uh, are housing homeless families with children within an average of 39 days. And we're currently really focusing a lot of attention on ending chronic homelessness. The phenomenon of chronic homelessness is defined as people with serious disabilities who have been living on the street or an emergency shelter for over a year, some of them 10 years, some of them 20 years. Um, and these are those folks that I was talking about that years ago would have been institutionalized for life. We still have 404 of them by last year's count. This year's count will be January 22nd. Where do the homeless sleep? We still have a lot of people sleeping on the street, 469. Um, but a few years ago, we had more unsheltered people than sheltered. So we, you know, we have made significant improvements <coughs> in this. I'm gonna skip over the next couple slides. You can look at those later on. What funding is available to address homelessness? So Unity, designated by HUD as the lead agency for um, New Orleans and Jefferson Parish, uh, you know, we, we are in charge of drawing down by competitive applications, <coughs> continuum of care funds. Um, the state also has a permanent supportive housing program, which is permanent rent assistance and case management for people with disabilities. Um, some of that is not even specific to homeless people, and then some of it is. And the part that is for homeless people, Unity administers for the state. The city has, um, something, a HUD program called Emergency Solutions Grant. That can be spent on emergency shelter, day shelter, short-term rent assistance, um, and that is about a million dollars that they have, which is not, not, not anything at all, really. I mean, when you think about the need out there, it's not a whole lot of money. Uh, some of it comes from the state to the city, but it all uh, comes from HUD. Then there's some city tax funds, primarily for the new low barrier shelter. Uh, the DVD and the convention center have committed funds, um, primarily for the new low barrier shelter and outreach. And then there's private resources, which I would guess probably are about $10 million in our city. It's a significant, you know, the, pr the private sector is providing a lot of resources. Um, and the HUD funds that we get require a 25% match. So, some of that is to match that, and some of that is to pay for things. For example, um, New Orleans Mission doesn't use any government money for its day-to-day -day operations, so they're all privately funded in terms of their day-to-day -day operations. The Salvation Army, most of, the, of their budget is private as well. Okay, uh, housing and services available to the homeless in our community. Um, some of these, uh, services are only available through the coordinated entry system. So the last part of my presentation will be talking about how to access that. But first, I just want to go through the types of services. First, in the area of housing crisis for people in an immediate housing crisis. Um, the street outreach is the most important, and I totally forgot to introduce Angela. It's OK. <laughs> Angela Patterson, uh, the deputy director of Unity, um, is 
a person that you will want to know intimately. Have her on your speed dial. <laughs> she is in charge of all the street outreach efforts. Um, not only those provided directly by Unity, but also by our, um, by our uh, partner organizations. And um, if you have a concern about a homeless person on the street, she focuses on the street homeless uh, population in particular, although her, your duties are voluminous, but that's, um, I think, the, the thing that you'll want to focus on. Um, you would want to contact her through Unity Welcome Home. Um, and you'll see <coughs> A. Patterson is her email address, and the two email addresses above it are her deputies, who are, um, you can contact any of them, or you can contact me if you're concerned about uh, somebody on the street who you want the outreach team to assess. Um, NOPD Homeless Collaborative, BB St. Roman, amazing woman. You should also have her on your speed dial uh, because she is also out there all the time uh, and is available and is available late into the night to uh, check on people. Volunteers of America, their outreach team is primarily uh, focused on veterans. And then Covenant House and Tulane Drop-In Center are focused on the population of people under 25, so the youth population. Um, day Shelter, the CRC is run by the Travelers Aid Society. That is the Community Resource and Referral Center in the old VA hospital on the first floor. That is a central access point, a central coordinated entry point. Um, that you can refer people to. Um, and they also provide showers and mail service, but they can assess people, they can um, figure out what they might be eligible for. Uh, the Harry Thompson Center does the same thing on Gravier, well, in behind St. Joseph Church, uh, a few blocks away from uh, the CRC. And then the Tulane Drop-In Center, of course, is for youth. Emergency shelter, those are some of the um, major shelters, those are the major shelters. Uh, the next slide is about what we call transitional housing. Our transitional housing for families really operates now as emergency shelter. Really, they are expected to house people very quickly in permanent housing. Um, and we actually do have enough housing resources to house all literally homeless families very quickly. Um, so that that piece we have you know we have solved that piece but the problem is that there's a lot of people in crisis all the time wanting to get into shelter and we don't have enough beds for them all so um, but you would access those programs through uh, the unity coordinated entry system which I'll talk about last transitional housing for veterans you would access it through the VA and the way to do that easily is at the CRC um, permanent housing. Again, rapid rehousing is the short-term rental assistance and it has case management. The requirements from HUD are that uh, people have to be literally homeless, living on the streets or emergency shelter. That has to be verified. It can't just be them saying it. Um, for families with children, you would contact the Unity Coordinated Entry System for young adults. You would contact Tulane or Covenant House veterans. Here's the contact information for veterans to get rapid rehousing and individuals. You would contact the Unity again. Um, permanent housing, uh, and this is about permanent supportive housing, that permanent ongoing lifetime rent assistance. Some clients actually graduate, but most of them need this resource for life because we prioritize it so well. It's really for people who are very impaired and have been homeless the longest. So some of them have been homeless for 10 or 20 years and it, they need constant support to keep from falling back into homelessness. You know, they, they have just tremendous problems. They're very mentally ill typically. Typically they're also very physically ill because the longer they're out on the street, the more their health deteriorated. Um, so in the case of the uh, continuum of care funded permit supportive housing, uh, which Unity coordinates, not only do they have to be 
have a disability and be living on the street or an emergency shelter when they're selected for the program. But by HUD requirement, nearly every slot we have has to be used by someone who meets the definition of chronic homelessness, and HUD has very detailed requirements for how you prove that. It's very onerous. So we have to actually prove, we actually have to have proof for every month they were out there. There has to be verification. It's, yeah, HUD is really insistent that we make sure that these resources go to the people who need them the most. How do they, how do they prove that they've been homeless? Well, because we have an outreach team who's out there all the time. In addition to so. that, we're able to use referrals from persons in the community who don't have an investment in them getting into that housing, such as grocery store owners, um, gas station managers, whoever might have encountered them, even regular citizens who live in these communities who know that that person has been sleeping on that porch for seven months. So we do get these ancillary types of um, information sharing, which is put in writing and which becomes a part of the person's record. Yeah. But it's a pretty onerous requirement because they really prefer it to be professional outreach workers, shelter records, and we have a homeless management information system that every single person is logged into every night so you can't come back later and say, oh, I was in the shelter because we have a record of who was there. In, so ad in addition, they're able to take a person's <coughs> self-statement for a period of time of three months, and then the rest of the year has to be accounted for by these outside sources. Yeah, but um, so that the continuum of care funded permit supportive housing is really for those people that are very severely disabled and have been living outside the longest. The VA supportive housing is also supposed to give preference to those folks, but has a broader definition of both homelessness and disability. And the Louisiana Permanent Supportive Housing Program, the part of it that is not required to be used by the homeless, doesn't require homelessness at all, just requires the household to be low income and that at least one household member, could be the child, has a disability. Uh, so those are the three sources of permanent supportive housing in our, in our community. Um, in terms of how to uh, access housing uh, through the coordinated entry system in the Unity Network, or just giving you the direct contact information, who you call, who you email. Uh, for the permanent supportive housing, uh, those are the uh, numbers. For um, rapid rehousing, those are the numbers. Um, and that would be for families. And then the next page would be rapid rehousing for youth under age 25. Uh, there's only two providers there, so they are both still doing their own um, coordinated entry, but they're using the same criteria and overseen by uh, the system. And then just for general homeless services and assessments and referrals, uh, that would be the Community Resource and Referral Center and the Harry Thompson Center are the best place uh, to have people go. Um, and I've given you my cell on the last page along with a funny picture that my staff likes <laughs> to use. <laughs> um, so please call Angela and me if there's ever anything we can do to help, you know, assess someone. You know, a lot of times you're, you're hearing from, um, you know, neighborhood leaders and residents who are concerned because a homeless person may be causing a problem for them. I mean, we, we've gotten all kinds of, you know, strange behaviors that are really causing problems for the people that live around people and you know we're happy to assess that person and see if um, you know if we can persuade them to go into shelter a lot of the most impaired people won't go in to a big congregate shelter because they're kind of paranoid about being around people usually though those same people are willing to go into apartments but that process can take a while first of all we have to figure out if they're chronically homeless and um, we're hoping, actually, that this summer, HUD, we may, we may get, and hopefully we'll hear soon, 
we applied for uh, some funding that was never before available um, for some rapid rehousing, short-term rent assistance. We don't have to have any requirement of chronic homelessness. We do have to show that they're literally homeless on the street or shelter, but not how long they've been there. We don't even have to prove disability. And uh, it's specifically to reduce street homelessness. So that pot of money w will be a significant um, resource for all of us to, to really address um, street homelessness. So cross your fingers, we should be soon whether we got that grant. Yes. So you mentioned that you've had graduates from, that you have moved on from the transitional housing? Oh, from permanent supportive housing. For permanent supportive yeah. housing, so that means they're on. Transitional housing too. But that's what you would expect from transitional because it's that's a congregate setting, so no one's going to be staying there long term. In fact, they can't by law. But for yeah. permanent supportive housing, the tenant is in, has a lease just like any other tenant, but it's it's got legal requirements on it that require you to allow them to stay forever as long as they're doing their share, which is paying a third of their income for rent, which is probably SSI, um, and so. But we still have some people who graduate, but usually they don't graduate from the need for affordable housing. So we have a partnership with Hano where every once in a while we can squeeze out a few vouchers from Hano to graduate someone off of permanent supportive housing so that we can use that slot for someone who's really chronically homeless and needs the supportive services, which are so key. Whereas in the Hano apartment, they won't have the supportive services, but the person doesn't need them anymore because they've gotten so stable. Um, yeah, I was just going to ask you about the the process of um, helping to find gainful employment for homeless people coming off the streets, and if that's been successful. You know, um, now, now our employment programs, HUD has basically defunded the freestanding employment programs we used to have because they no longer really want to fund freestanding supportive services. So now our employment work is primarily embedded in these housing programs. So for example, one of the key things that a rapid rehousing provider does for us is they find employment for people who don't have employment or better employment for people whose jobs just won't support housing. And that's a key part of what case managers are expected to do and what they do do. Um, uh, we also, you know, work with what are called supported employment programs for, you know, people with disabilities who may not be, uh, who may benefit from some kind of part-time employment, um, but may not be able to do full-time employment just because of the disabilities. So, um, and in addition to that, um, a group of us have been meeting recently with um, Judge Zaney and some other uh, community um, uh, folks about starting uh, an employment program that really would be targeted to people who are right now living on the street and it's not just embedded in the housing program. So that even if they weren't accepted into a housing program, if they're just trying to raise the money with which to put down a deposit for first month's rent, that they would have some help getting uh, employment resources. I would say really that, that is a key gap in our system now because of the defunding of, of our uh, prior employment projects. It's a, it's a huge need. Yes. Is there funding or support to help the people who've been chronically homeless or homeless for a long time to get an ID so that they can get employment? Uh, again, Judge Zaney has a project called the HELP Project, which uses uh, lawyers to help with that. But a lot of you know, the outreach team is doing that. BB St. Roman does a lot of that. A lot of folks are doing that, yeah. I mean, that is a, a critical need. The shelters are doing that. But you're right, ID, ID is critical. BB yeah. get anything done without yeah, ID. Yeah, right. BB is on a weekly basis, twice a week. One day she goes to the Azanan Inn, another day she goes to the Harry Thompson Center, and she picks up people at specific times and brings them, and the program pays for their picture IDs. And obviously it's an issue how many picture IDs some people have to obtain simply because of still being street homeless. Few questions. Yes. 
How much of homelessness is mental? How much is it by choice? How much is it economic? Uh, I would say that 99.9% .9 is economic. <laughs> um, so that is a common thread with virtually every homeless person. I used to run a legal services project for the homeless. So I was seeing direct clients all the time. I, I can only recall one time I saw a client who actually had money. And because of an addiction, couldn't access you know, wasn't able to access the money and was living on the street. Um, if you think about it, all of us know, I'm sure we all know people who have severe mental illness and severe addictions who are housed, right? Uh, Donald Trump. <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes in really nice housing, right? Yeah. Um, so, the, so, so the common thread that all homeless people have, virtually all homeless people, is that they need affordable housing. They're very, very poor. They need affordable housing. Um, maybe as many as half have mental illness. Um, there are no you know, perfect statistics about that because much of our data is self-reported. Um, you know, like in our point in time account, we're asking homeless people the question of do you have mental illness? And uh, a lot of them, don't even know that they have it, <laughs> or they're going to deny it even if they know they have it. So you don't necessarily get, you know, the right answer about that statistic. But I would say it's somewhere between a quarter to a half probably have mental illness. Substance use disorders are also quite prevalent as well. Um, in the chronically homeless population, the people that have been out there for over a year, almost all of them have mental illness. Almost, I would say, 80% have mental illness and or substance addiction, and oftentimes both. Um, and you know, it could be alcohol, it could be drugs, but, and it's hard to say, chicken and egg. Did they start drinking too much or drugging because they're out on the street? I would probably do that too, fr quite frankly. <laughs> you know, I mean, I can't even imagine the terror, especially for women, of being out there, but, um, yeah, that's really common that people have those things. But again, most people who have those problems are housed. <laughs> and they're housed in our community. And they're our neighbors and members of our family. I'm sure you know we all can think of people who are housed who have those problems. But uh, homeless people, the major problem for them is, is the um, extreme poverty. And they don't, and maybe the combination of the two things. Uh, we're a deeply rooted community, lots of family resources, right? A lot of people have a lot of relatives. But if you have those problems, a lot of times you kind of run through your family relationships and they can't really take care of you anymore. And maybe they'll take you in when the weather gets really cold, but uh, you know, on an ongoing basis, they can't have you permanently stay with them. So, um, you know, it's probably a combination of things, but. The lack of affordable housing is the key driver around the country for which cities are seeing spikes in homelessness and which cities are not. Um, and so I think that is a serious issue for us right now in New Orleans because um, you know, if we, if we want to keep making progress, the key thing is really about expanding the supply of affordable housing. Which at this point is very difficult to do with short-term rentals and um, all of this grand interest that we have in what traditionally were affordable neighborhoods. So where are you in terms of, and I don't know the exact numbers, but do you yeah. have enough housing stock available to you now to help 10% of the folks out there now, or you got enough housing stock to handle 90% of them? And then what's the plan to get more available stock when you fill those up? Um. You know, we really do not have the capacity to actually build the housing ourselves. So we are basically using the housing that's already out there in the community. I mean, after Katrina, we had access to a few resources. To, and we did build a few small apartment buildings at that point. But now we're basically using just what, you know, um, landlords are out there, big, small, in between. Um, and it gets harder and harder to find the units. It's particularly hard to find the one bedroom units. Um, and efficiencies are non-existent. 
But those are really what the folks, most of the folks out there are unaccompanied adults. They need one bedroom apartments. If there was one thing we want to say to developers, please develop one bedroom apartments. There's a, there's a huge need for that with the workforce as well, with young people as well, but especially with reducing homelessness. That is what people need. So from what you've seen with the affordable housing drying up, is that likely to cause an addition? Not, not, not the housing ones that's on the street now, but with affordable housing being sucked up every day, is that likely to increase our homeless population? Yes, absolutely. We are we are fighting a battle, you know, head on winds here because, you know, we're doing a good job at bringing in resources, and we've got just fabulously hardworking people in all of these agencies that are just working their butts off, and we're making progress. But we we're up against a headwind because the supply is dwindling by the day rather than increasing and it gets harder and harder to find landlords who are willing to rent to our clients when they could be getting higher rents somewhere else and with rapid rehousing the short-term rent assistance um, you know there's a difference between our permanent supportive housing uh, there you have to talk the landlord into taking a, a tenant who's got severe behavioral health issues probably but we're able to provide market rate rent because we have a permanent subsidy and the, the client supplies a third of their income for rent and then our subsidy makes up the difference and this is a permanent subsidy so you know there's an incentive for a lot of right. landlords to be willing to work with our clients and at least they have a case manager that they can call 24 7 more or less and just but, in general how much of the, the homeless population is working homeless um I don't know if I have data on that, but it's higher than you would think. Right. Yeah, most of the families that come into shelter, the mom has a job, but it might be a part-time job. She might be working at McDonald's. She can't. She can't pay rent. These rents are just so part of the public perception about all these people being bums and dope fiends and all that stuff is inaccurate. You've got very good families she, who have yes. run into yes. situations that they could not avoid. Right. That are out there on the street. Right. which makes it a lot easier to get folks to want to empathize and sympathize yes. with them. Yeah. And that's the kind of story I think we all need to be yeah. telling because as this affordable yeah. housing dries up, yeah. I think we're going to see more and more of that. Yes. And and yeah. again, if you can't pay the rent, the landlord yeah. going to kick you out. Yeah. And then what do you do? I yeah. just spoke to someone this morning before leaving the office and she was in exactly that situation. She described that she is a senior citizen. Her husband just passed away. She lost his source of income because he's deceased, and she can no longer afford the housing that they were both in. So she is being forced to go into a shelter. She gets $750 SSI payment a month, and she cannot afford the rents that are out there. So she was crying profusely but that is remarkably and quite unremarkably going to be the scenario of the future. Yeah. And, and this is going to sound like a dumb question, but just walk with me. How, how often is the population repopulated? If you house somebody on Monday, when does it take somebody, I mean, how, how long does it take for somebody else to come and take their homeless place? Immediately. The, the next day we have many people tents. entering the system who weren't homeless the night before. So we're constantly dealing with influx. Yes. This is a white one night statistic on that that, that chart mm -hmm. I showed you, the 1301. That's one night. Over the course of the year, you know, we're going to be seeing uh, probably four times as many people. Um, yeah, it, it's it, it's a, that's what what makes this a challenging problem is because it's not like it's one and done. Uh, <laughs> it's not like it's just a downward trajectory, but you're also having to deal with all the influx. And we are a city with a very high poverty rate, and that is what drives our homelessness. You know, a large percentage of our population every year is becoming homeless. And some of them, it might not be the first time. It might, it might be something that happens episodically throughout their lives. I mean, if you don't have, especially with the extended family network getting all torn to pieces because of Katrina, people have less it used to be harder for people to be homeless because they had more relatives, but now you might be back and there's not a whole Nobody lot of other people back in your family and you know, you get sick. 
you have a minimum wage job, that means you lost your job because you don't have sick days. So you lost your job. Okay, so now what do you do? You can't pay the rent. Um, I mean, you all know all this because you were Dorothy Bay Taylor's <laughs> chief staff. You know all this. It's, um, we it's see a crisis for poor people in our city. Where are the homeless? They're all over the city now, much more so than before, but they're concentrated a lot downtown and in Central City. So the but perception that they're all downtown in Central City is not accurate, they're no, all over. They're even in Lakeview. So this is not just town. a District B problem, this right. is a citywide it's problem. It's a citywide problem, right. definitely. And that's another thing that I've been having difficulty getting people to understand, that this ain't just affecting people right. uptown. There are people across this city yeah. that are going to need help and resources. Right. This needs to be a collective effort, Correct. not just kind of, granted, you see more of them downtown under the bridge, but they're everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And you may be oblivious to them, yeah. but that don't mean they ain't there. Right. And the downtown homeless problem, of course, affects, you know, the middle class and the upper class because it affects, uh, you know, people who are going to their jobs and they're having to uh, deal with that. And it also, it also affects tourism. And that affects the economy for the whole city. So, yeah, in every way, this affects all of us. And the demographics of? Mm -hmm. The demographics? Of, um, of, of generally, single females, single males, children. It's mostly, I think there's a slide on here. It is, single it is um, you know, we have a lot of families with children. Uh, we don't have that many shelter beds for families with children. So that kind of, um, uh, that, that kind of is the cap on how many families can even be considered homeless by HUD because we don't have enough beds for them. So there are a lot of families in our city that are in situations worse than homeless. And because when they go in a shelter, shelter beds. how long can they stay in a shelter? Uh, there's no limit on that per se, but we have a commitment that once a family enters shelter, we get them housed within an average of 39 days. So that is our commitment to the family. And we're really proud that we've been able to do that. Um, with a with uh, single adult population, uh, you might find some people in shelter for a long time, but the problem with that is that all the shelters have weird rules, and um, most, most times you can't stay in the shelter very long. So for example, the Oz has 10 free days after right. that. You can't stay there unless you go into a long-term program which has more restrictive rules. And, or you have to just line up and hope that nobody else, you know, there weren't enough people that coming in there that night, which I don't think ever happens. With the Salvation Army, you have to pay $10 a night. That's a lot of It's very indigent. And at the New Orleans Mission, I think they're on a 30-day on, 30-day off policy. So you can only stay there 30 days, and you have to stay out 30 days, and you come back, you come back in. And it's not long enough for people to actually have addressed the problems, given the fact that there is right now no rapid rehousing assistance available uh, to help them uh, unless they're chronically homeless. So if I had a magic wand. Yeah and could wave it and help you do what you do. What would you need from the city council to be able to help you make a real impact? What a wonderful question. <laughs> you know, um, the thing that we would most like to see is that the city start spending more of its own money on homelessness rather than just relying on the HUD money. Um, most other cities are spending. And spend it where? What, what would you want? Give me an idea of what. <coughs> I would what want it spent. I would want it spent on rapid rehousing and homelessness prevention primarily, and also so, shelter. Nora has a whole ton of properties that they're doing nothing with. Yeah. Hano is not city, but they got a ton of land and property that they're doing anything with. With untangling some of that, help with the rapid rehousing. Uh, if it could be turned, you know, returned to commerce and actually, oh no, we got to do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah I mean, made made into a decent apartment. Um, we don't have, you know, we we need more short term rent assistance. We need more um, more rent assistance that's available for people who are not homeless yet, because right now the only thing that's available is 
homeless assistance. You know, there's no rent assistance available for people who aren't homeless, and there's all these people that need it, and why should they have to go into a shelter? Before they can get out. Yeah, but wh why should children be subjected to that? So I'd like to see a lot more homelessness prevention money, but that's really well used. And we have some, uh, there are some really great national protocols for how to use it. I think in the past, it hasn't necessarily been as well used. Because you can imagine everybody wants it. It's a matter of figuring out how to target it really well. The other thing is just that we have this really big unsheltered population, and we really need to do a better job of sheltering people. And we really need to take more responsibility for it. You know, some city employees at the EMS and at NOPD, uh, they came up with a, a list this year of 62 people who died on the street. I mean, it's just terrible. Homelessness kills people. That's, I think, the main thing I want to leave you with. It's like, it's a life and death issue. And the fact that we have such a high percentage of our homeless population is unsheltered because we don't have enough shelter is really a crying shame, which is why that low barrier shelter is really needed. And that may not be all that's needed. We probably should do more. I'd like to see every time we have a freeze night that we're opening a community center um, to take more people in because while the existing shelters try to take more people in, they just don't have that much room. <laughs> they can't possibly absorb the 500 unsheltered people on, that, on those nights. And the severely mentally ill and behaviorally disturbed person who is homeless will typically not go to a traditional shelter even if they're risking freezing to death. So it really becomes a very challenging situation unless there is an alternative shelter where they will willingly agree to go. But I do want to not, I, I want you not to feel too discouraged about this problem because I realize maybe we've been, you know, we have really reduced homelessness and I believe that we can continue to do that. Um, and we just need to be really smart about making sure that we're using our resources for the people who need them the most. And I believe we can continue to drive down these rates and whatever the council can do to keep trying to increase the supply of affordable housing. I know that's challenging, but other cities are addressing it. Um, you know, I, I believe we can continue to make progress. This past fall, we had this unbelievable campaign. It was called 200 Homes for the Holidays. We set a goal of housing um, 40 homeless families, literally homeless families, in apartments, and 160 uh, chronically homeless individuals with disabilities have been living on the street for over a year. And we way exceeded that goal. Uh, 243 uh, homeless households. It was 57 families and 186 chronically homeless people with disabilities. I mean, you got a lot of nonprofits here who are really kicking butt, so to speak. I mean, they are really, I mean, people who are working night and day to do this. One woman at Crescent Care, the former No, no AIDS Task Force, uh, she housed 40 chronically homeless individuals just herself. So, you know, you got, you got some, I think the public private partnership we have here is one of the best things in the country on this issue. And you have some really great stuff happening. And, um, you know, I think working together, uh, we, can, we can do even more. And if the city can do even just a little bit more, it, it'll help tremendously. Well, I'm committed to try to help you do a little bit more. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> and um, I have not had this conversation with my colleagues, but the feeling I get for them is I think they get it. Yeah. And I think we're going to have the will to try to make some things happen. So Great. I want to continue this dialogue and I need you to tell me, see I'm smart enough to know what I don't know. <laughs> and I don't know how to be most effective. So I'm gonna need you to give me some guidance and direction on exactly what we need to try to do yeah. to try to diminish this number. So Great. you've got a partner with me. Great, well thank, thank you. you. We'll, we'll call you and set up a meeting. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you all so thank much. You. I have one question. Yeah. So uh, when these apartments become available for people, uh, uh, are these, partially furnished or furnished or are people being put in you know, apartments where they're in an empty room? Great question. <laughs> so, you know, HUD makes a point, and this is 
unique really to this program. I don't know any other HUD programs where they require a 25% match. They deliberately do not fund everything. One of the things that they don't fund is the furniture and the household goods and the things that people need. I mean, you can imagine these folks have nothing. Um, they need everything. They need everything the same way that, you know, if you had a kid Are going away to college and getting get their first apartment, all that stuff they need. They need they need the bed sheets, they need the furniture, they need the coffee <laughs> everything. Pack. Yeah, we all went through it, right? right? So we have a warehouse at Unity, and we collect gently used goods from everybody. And we're trying to expand that warehouse now and get a bigger space so we can accept more stuff. So anytime you hear of people who have furniture that they want to give away, uh, you know, not extraneous stuff. We're not looking for, you know, <laughs> something. We basic livable. Basic stuff, especially tables and chairs, beds, bureaus, you know, so that sofas that aren't too that huge. Would, would yeah. That. <laughs> yeah, nothing gold plated, you know, just simple uh -huh. stuff. Um, and any household goods, you know, all the kitchen stuff that you need, the dishes, the pots and pans, the towels, the, you know, all that stuff we need. The bedrooms, cleaning supplies. Cleaning supplies. That stuff we usually want new. Uh, toiletries, we need that new. But that's something that, you know, um, you could do a drive. You know, we have churches, you know, we have um, all, all different kinds of faith-based groups doing that. We have schools, we have school kids doing drives for us. We have, you know, but we need more. It's never enough. It's never enough. <laughs> and this past, this past campaign just really exhausted our capacity to do it. So we, we have people right now who have like nothing in their apartment and we're scrambling to get them stuff because as Angela has pointed out to me many times, that is the number one factor for why um, a chronically homeless person won't stay in their apartment. You, you put them in an empty space where they don't even have a bed, that's not going to work. They're not going to stay there. First, well, That's not a whole lot better than being out on the street. But if we put them in a place that's, you know, it doesn't have to be fancy, but it's reasonably comfortable. They, and they, they, where they can call it home. Yeah. And we, you know, we inspect these apartments because this is HUD funding, and we, we maintain really high standards. Like, they have to be really high-quality apartments. And one of the things that we end up doing is we work with those mom-and-pop landlords to educate them about what they need to do to fix up the apartment so it can meet our, our requirements. Uh, sometimes that requires going back and forth with them three or four times before they finally get the apartment to the level that we need it to be. And then every, if it's a permanent supportive housing apartment placement, we would have to go back and inspect it every year. And if we ever, the case manager ever walked in and saw that something was not good, then we'd have to address that with the landlord right away. So um, it's a lot of work on an ongoing basis to do this. A lot of people working at it in your city. Well, we're fortunate to have you and Angela and the rest of the great folks at Unity. Thank, Thank you, David. Thank you for inviting us. We were very fortunate to have you all here this morning. I mean, this was uh, an idea that was birthed in Jay Banks' head, and I think it's marketed pretty well this morning. Um, we covered the terrain. Jay Banks has the issues, man. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we very much want your feedback. If you fill out either an evaluation sheet or uh, give us your suggestions about where you think we might go in the future. Send me an email. I mean, all of these things work. We want it to be responsive to your needs and interests. Um, but thanks, Martha and Angela, for being with us this morning. Thank thanks to all invitation. of you for joining us. You know, there's a line that um, Spencer Tracy used in reference to Katherine Hepburn back in one of their movies together. Um, there's not much there, but what's there is Cherse. Well, we had a modest representation this morning, but what was here was church, so thank you. Yes, thank you. It's great.